If there is an icon of Darwin's theory, it is this. A metaphor for all evolutionary history. A tree. The twigs, Darwin said, were species. And they were connected to their ancestors by branches, and those ancestors to theirs reaching deep into the past so that the whole history of life could be represented as a great tree. Darwin first conceived this image in 1837. He sketched a simple tree-like diagram to show how lineages could originate from a single source and then diverge and proliferate. Above it, he scribbled the words, I think. 22 years later, in the origin, he confidently asserts that just such a tree could be constructed for any group of creatures. Easy to say, hard to do, and Darwin didn't even try. Why did Darwin, so bold and so visionary, not give us the history of life that his theory implied? Perhaps it was because he was so acutely aware of the deficiencies of the fossil record. The rocks ought to bear mute testimony to titanic conflicts playing out over eons of time. But as Richard Owen had so cruelly exposed, the reality was rather different. Animal fossils were abundant, but there were also huge gaps. And nowhere was the gap greater than at the base of the Cambrian. That's when an explosion of animal life seems to have occurred. New species, entire faunas, emerged as if from nowhere, their ancestors absent. Those rocks over there are Cambrian. That makes them around 525 million years old. And they contain animal life. Wonderful creatures such as brachiopods and ostracods and trilobites. These rocks are Precambrian. They're only about 30 million years older, and yet they are empty. There are no animal remains in them whatsoever. But how could this be? If these Precambrian rocks didn't have any fossils in them, where did the animals come from? Characteristically, Darwin didn't shirk the problem. During these vast and unknown periods of time, he wrote, the world must have swarmed with living creatures. That he couldn't produce them was, he admitted, a grave difficulty. Darwin despaired of being able to reconstruct the history of life. Yet he did not doubt that his successors would do just that. And so they have. Enter one of Darwin's most ardent disciples. A young German scientist, Ernst Haeckel. Of all the scientists who followed Darwin, Haeckel was the most protean. A gifted artist who could reveal nature's exquisite geometries with the stroke of a pen. He was also a brilliant anatomist, devoting months to the study of obscure sea creatures. And he was a romantic of the sentimental, nature-loving, Goethe-worshipping German kind. For Haeckel loved his cousin, Anna. She had golden hair and blue eyes. He described her as a true German child of the forest. Haeckel was besotted with her and married her. What bliss, but for only a few months. And then she died. Anna's death left Haeckel unhinged. He contemplated suicide, but then he found religion. Not the false consolations of Christianity, but the harsh, godless clarity of Der Darwinismus. He would become its greatest apostle. He would take the good book to the German masses. He would preach the truth. And he would do what Darwin had so conspicuously failed to do. He would rewrite the history of life. But how? Haeckel needed a way of reconstructing the evolutionary past that did not rely on fossils. 
The answer, he said, was to look at the embryo. The embryo of an animal contains, is a record of its evolutionary past. And the earlier in development you look, the further back into that past you could see. The embryo, Heckel said, is Ariadne's thread. He began by comparing vertebrate embryos. Just before birth, they seem very different, as you'd expect. But follow the embryos back in time to when they are younger and less developed, they look remarkably alike. They have the same dorsal nerve cords, the same pharyngeal slits. But Heckel looked further, deeper into the embryo, earlier into its development, before the limbs appear, before there's a head or a tail, and further yet, to when it is but a ball of cells with the beginnings of a gut. This is a stage of development called gastrulation, and here, he thought, he found something wonderful, the ancestor of us all. Here, said Heckel, is a remembrance, a recollection, a recapitulation of the very first animal. A creature, no more than a ball of flagellated cells that had once whirled through the Precambrian seas. He called it the Gastria and said it was his most important discovery. Others said it was his most outrageous invention. Heckel used embryos to produce evolutionary trees, lots of them. They look a bit like Darwin's tree, but they are not abstract metaphors. They are the first attempt to put every living thing in its evolutionary place. All the animals are there, in more or less the right order. And somewhere near the base of the trunk leading to all the other animals is the gastria, Heckel's hypothetical ancestral beast. Heckel's speculations were no doubt too bold. The embryo does not contain a simple picture of the history of life. And yet, there is no doubt that his guesses were, more often than not, inspired. Since the 1950s, a trickle of animal fossils has been emerging from Precambrian rocks. Some are little more than imprints, others are minute. But by using computer tomography imaging, even individual cells can be seen. And what's more, some of these proto-creatures are not so very different from Heckel's gastria. But there's another reason to think that animals lived long before the Cambrian, and that's because DNA tells us so. When Watson and Crick elucidated the structure of DNA, they unified life. The DNA story is without doubt one of the greatest success stories in the history of science, because it can't be often that two newcomers to a field make such a major discovery so quickly. Nearly all living things use DNA as the stuff of inheritance, so they must all be related and descend, much as Darwin had supposed, from a single ancestor. <laughs> but now we can go further. We can sequence the genome of any living thing and read it as if we were reading a book. Genomes are documents written in billions of letters. They are palimpsests, endlessly augmented, erased, and rewritten by the hand of evolution. And if you can read them, you can read the history of life. By sequencing genomes, we can now date the origin of animals in the tree of life. Some of them turn out to be astonishingly ancient. Perhaps the simplest of all animals is a microscopic creature called trichoplax. Doesn't have a gut, a mouth, a brain, or even sense organs. Its genome suggests that its ancestors departed from the main trunk of animal evolution perhaps a billion years ago. Just as Darwin had supposed, there must have been animals in the Precambrian seas. 
The sequencing machines are revealing new branches on the Tree of Life. They are giving us a new historical narrative. But we are also discovering new fossils. And often, the story they tell is the same. Consider the whale. Whales obviously evolved from some land mammal. But if so, where were the fossil half whales? Where were the whales with legs? By Darwin's logic, they must have existed and they must have been big. So where were they? For years, the origin of whales was shrouded in obscurity. Not anymore. In recent decades, the fossil record has become wonderfully complete. Just as Darwin had predicted, just as Darwin had hoped, we now have an astonishing array of fossils that show how a land mammal makes a transition to one that lives in the sea. They show how front limbs evolve into flippers and how hind limbs just wither away and how a whale comes to breathe not through nostrils and the tips of its snout, but rather a blowhole in the back of its head. And they show us one more thing. They tell us about the place of whales in the tree of life. The evidence hinges literally on an ankle bone. For primitive whales, it turns out, have ankle bones that are remarkably similar to those of modern ungulates, such as cows, sheep, and pigs. Yet we don't have to rely on fossilized bones to tell us about the ancestry of whales. We can use DNA too. And to do that, we have to go to Africa. Compare the DNA of a cetacean to that of any other mammal, and something surprising emerges. Their closest living relative is this, a hippo. It's not that whales evolved from hippos, or that hippos evolved from whales. Rather, it is simply that hippos and cetaceans are, as it were, cousins. They are descended from a common ancestor that lived perhaps 55 million years ago. It is precisely this sort of agreement between DNA and fossil evidence that makes the case for evolution so utterly compelling. And so, to the evolution of the one species we care about more than any other. One might have expected Darwin to say something about human evolution. And, in the origin of species, he does. After 400 pages of ants and acutes, bats and barnacles, the whole bestia, in fact, right through to zebras, he settles down to consider humanity. And what he says is this. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. And that's it. Well, thanks for that, Charles. Darwin, of course, knew we were descended from apes, but left others to spell it out. Among them, Ernst Haeckel. With a characteristic flourish, he imagined humanity like Botticelli's Venus, rising gloriously from the brutes that surround her. At the time, there were no fossils linking man to apes. And so he set to imagining what lay between. No human fossils? No problem. Let's just invent one. Something between an ape and a man. Let's give it a name. Ape man. Let's give it a real proper Latin name. Pithecanthropus. Like the Gastria, Pithecanthropus was an invention, a hypothetical ancestor. Yet Haeckel's reasoning was sound. If we were descended from apes, 
that sooner or later, intermediates would be found. In 1891, a Dutch physician, Eugene Dubois, digging in the banks of the Solo River in Java, discovered this skull cap. It wasn't human, it wasn't ape, it was an ape man. In homage to Haeckel, Dubois called it Pithecanthropus. In the centuries since, Pithecanthropus has acquired a new name, Homo erectus and has been joined by a collection of other fossils. Some apish humans, others human apes. The family tree of humanity can now be richly filled with species, and there's a clear and unambiguous line between the earliest apes and us, Homo sapiens. But which of the great apes, now alive, is our closest relation? That question, endlessly debated since Darwin's time, hasn't been answered by fossils. It required DNA. By comparing DNA sequences from each of the great apes, the order of evolutionary descent has become clear. We're genetically closest to chimpanzees and bonobos, Five to six million years ago, our ancestor was theirs. Seven million years ago, we shared an ancestor with the gorilla. Twelve million years ago, with an orangutan. And so on, back to the very beginning of life. Who do you think you are? asked Hackle, and answered. You are an ape, a mammal, a reptile, a fish, a worm, a ball of cells, and finally, a single cell floating in the saline womb of the primordial seas. 150 years ago, Darwin spoke of a time when the tree of life would be more than a metaphor, when it would be an accurate historical record. That time has come. The tree of life stands before us, its branches becoming clearer with every fossil and DNA sequence. And our species is but a leaf on a twig, buried within its vast and ramifying canopy.